go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17 eventually, Matthew chapter 17, <clears throat> we're continuing on <clears throat> in our study of follow me, follow me, here follow me faithing, showing the action of faith, <clears throat> and so by way of introduction, what a time we're living in. What a time we're living in where showing our faith and, and demonstrating it openly. And such a huge statement can be made by simply going to church. Something we've often taken for granted, all of us I'm sure. To go and to assemble with God's people, now that has become a, a great act of faith. We're living in a time when pastors are cast into prison for even daring to hold an assembly. Well, isn't that what pastors do by nature? As I said before, Pastor James Coates, Grace Life Church there in Stony Plain, Alberta, he has been holding church, as always. He was arrested last week. He was released. He held church again, asked to turn himself in, and did so after preaching that message there on Romans 13 I talked about. The conditions of his bail would, was that not only would he not hold church this Sunday, but that he wouldn't preach. From what I understand, even if he's to open up a live stream and just start preaching to the people, he'd be looked at as causing incitement because he's got such an influence on the people there in Stony Plain, Alberta. And so the man sits in a prison cell, solitary confinement, deemed a health risk to the city and to the province and therefore cast into maximum security of prisons. Can you imagine? For his words and for his stand and for his position in holding church. <laughs> and really, he has the same position as we have. Our position is what? We ought to be consistent in our, in our faithfulness to God. Just keep doing what we're doing and I believe that was the message when I first heard of these lockdowns starting let's just keep doing what we're doing continue on as we did aforetime was the message and we ought to be consistent in our walk with God we ought to then also obey God rather than men by extension because God is supreme God is above all and God's word is above all and that is the highest of authorities that we have especially as believers to yield ourselves unto so men come and they contradict that. We obey God rather than men, whatever the case and whatever they say. Our other position is that church is essential and all of its practices to be coordinated, to be commanded, to be guided by the church as they feel they are best following Christ. Christ at the head, the church underneath. And so... At least in these three things, we are in the same position as this pastor out there in Alberta. We don't fall under every agreement and every doctrinal position and what have you, of course, and nobody really ever does in the world of independent churches. Nonetheless, in these things we agree, and therefore in these things we can certainly stand with the man and his church. Now this pastor, he communicated through social media. His wife came out. And, and posted the conversations that they had had. And his prayer in all of this was that men would stand. Not selfish, not, not give me something to post my bail or help me through this. He just said, I pray that men would stand for their faith and for the word of God and for the doctrines that they say they believe in. He was asked, well, what should they do if they want to support him? What should we do if we wanted to support such a man? He said, first, open your church. And be in church. And we're with him on that, aren't we? He said, let your pastor, when he does open, see the whites of your eyes as he's preaching the word to you. Secondly, if you want to support him, he said, worship Christ. Thirdly, if you want to support him, practice your faith. Let men see it. And fourthly, if you want to 
support me as I'm in jail, he said, pray. As far as I can see, I support him in all of these. We ought to be consistent. We ought to obey a God rather than a man. Church certainly is essential to the life of the Christian. I would go as far as to say church is essential for the life of the world at large. This is how God sets out truth. The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Without the church, do you know what you have? You have Caesar, Pilate rather, saying, what is truth? The world saying, what is truth? The church will tell you. And so I have that same plea. Open your church, preachers. Worship Christ, believers. Practice your faith, believers. Pray without ceasing. And so in these things, I certainly support this pastor and stand with him. And as much as this is a fight in our country that we need to be mindful of, and it's a spiritual battle. Nobody is saying take up arms or anything foolish like that. We are saying we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places, which hate the church, hate Christians, and hate the work of God. And this is an amazing time, as I said, because for the first time in many generations, especially here in our country, Christians here are being forced to shore their faith. We're literally being forced forced to either stand with the world or against the world, with Christ or without, and away from Christ. We're being forced into doing things that we once took for granted. Something as simple as going to church. Something as simple as saying, no, I will not yield to that because that particular mandate goes against my God-given rights as a believer in Christ. And you have no authority in this realm. Of course, then talking about who's ever making these mandates. So we're being called then, Christians, to be active in our faith. And we're really being forced into it, aren't we? And we need to do that by the action, the verb, faithing. Faithing. Showing your faith. Turn with me, keep your finger there in Matthew chapter 18. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. I just wanted to talk a bit in, um, in reflections to last week's message about the transfiguration. <clears throat> we are currently being forced into doing what God has always expected of his children. Was that we would show our faith to this lost and dying world. We would be active in our belief by demonstrating what we believe in. Remember, we are in 2 Peter chapter 1, and the Bible talked about how these first obtained like precious faith. These were believers that were being written to. And then Peter called them unto glory and virtue through the word of God. So take the faith that you have and go into your calling, which is to add to it glory, virtue, and many other like things that embolden and embody a perfect believer. Peter did all of that in reflection to what Christ demonstrated on the Mount of Transfiguration. I'm not going to go and quote it, but when you look up that term transfiguration, of course, in our English Bible it's mentioned twice. Once in Matthew there and once in Mark, and it's the same scenario. Now, I remembered thinking about these verses, and I wish that I'd put them on to the end of the sermon to really tie everything together. But what we have is that same Greek word there that underlies the English language, referred to not just in those two places, specifically in the same context, the story being retold between Matthew and Mark, but you also have it in Romans chapter 12, and look at verse 1. Romans 12 and verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, and this is the same thing that Peter was trying to push on to the believers, in reflection of the transfiguration. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, look, believers, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable service as one of the brethren, as a sister, as a believer on Christ, is to present yourself 
everything that you are, your body, as a living sacrifice. In other words, it's constantly being given to God and His service. Holy, acceptable unto God, that is what is reasonable. That is, that is the bar. You're not going above and beyond. You're simply meeting what God finds proper, reasonable, and acceptable when you give all of yourself. Verse 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world. Okay? So don't get caught up in the flesh. Don't get caught up in, remember the tabernacle we talked about? The, the earthly tabernacle? But rather stand in the light of God. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. There it is. The same word, transfiguration, transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So don't be conformed to this world, but be changed. Be transformed. Be as Christ was when he was in the Mount of Transfiguration. Bright, shining in all of his glory. That's what we're called to be, presented to this lost and dying world. As it gets darker and darker and darker, we ought to appear brighter and brighter and brighter. Remember Moses? He had to cover his face because the world could not steadfastly look upon him for the great fear that they had when they beheld him. After what? He was in the presence of God and his glory was upon him. Next, go to 2 Corinthians, if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Look with me in verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 in verse 17. Now, the Lord is that Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. God meets with us, there's liberty. The Spirit of God falls upon this assembly. There's liberty. We have freedom in Christ. Verse 18, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. In other words, nothing blocking our face. We're beholding in the fullness the glory of God. That takes some boldness, because look what happened to so many believers when they stood in the glory of God on the ground is dead, right? But we as, as, as Bible-believing, saved, blood-bought, born-again Christians can now, in the Spirit of the Lord, that has granted us the liberty to do so, we can now stand before Him open face, nothing blocking us, nothing hindering the vision and the visage of Christ before us. We, as with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed, Look at this, into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know that saying? The Spirit of God will change, will transform, will transfigure you into the same image of Christ. Of course, that's to be realized once we are receiving of our glorified bodies. We die, the resurrection takes place, and we're changed in a moment in the twinkling of eye at the last trump different word there but the same idea it's all there in the english bible i'm not doing anything special here i just noticed it was interesting because that actually affirms what peter was trying to say open face beholding the glory of the lord in a mirror changed into that same image from glory to glory even as by the spirit of god his power upon us his spirit is what facilitates that change, that transformation, that transfiguration to take place. It says there, we are changed. Okay, so that's a faith position. Because the Apostle Paul isn't here talking about someday afar off, though that is going to be true one day. He says, we are changed. Present tense. That's a present tense word, isn't it? Not a will be, not a one day can be, not a shall be. Currently, you are changed changed into the same glorious image of God, the problem is sometimes we just don't act like it. If Christ is in you, you have the hope of glory. You have the promise. And as sure as his word is, in that promise, is as sure as you stand now in that present truth. You know what that is? It's like when Christ was offered as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world 
and saved people prior to the time when he was slain in this world. Why? Because God said it would come to pass, and it's as good as done. God says that you will be changed into the same glory as of Christ by the Spirit of the Lord. It's as good as done. And that's your present reality. You just have to walk in that by faith. Through faith, we can receive of that same position in that same standing. We talked about that, how you're either one of the multitude or you're one of the disciples or you're one of those three that dwell in that light of God and invited to do so. We have the opportunity to do so. So going back then to Matthew chapter 17, and the main thrust of the message is we need an active faith. Why? Because we are changed. We are glorified. We are transformed. We are, if you will, transfigured in the same way that Christ is. We just don't all act like it. <laughs> and that's where we end up essentially quenching the working of the Spirit of God. Matthew chapter 17, look with me in verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, but they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. The child was cured from that very hour. The accusation of Christ towards his disciples, I believe primarily here, was that they were faithless. They were full of doubt, lacking faith, belief, trust in the promises of God. Even as if you would in Deuteronomy chapter 32. In Deuteronomy chapter 32. <clears throat> These were unbelieving and therefore they could not cure the man. They could not cure his son. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 18 it says, Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful. Hast forgotten God that formed thee. The Bible records, I believe in Ephesians 2, that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We have been formed by him. We are begotten of him unto a lively hope. We become the sons of God, according to John chapter 1. And of that rock, when we fall into unbelief, when we fall into doubt, when we are not acting in faith, we are faithless. Of that rock, of the rock, Jesus Christ, that begot us, we're out mindful. We're not mindful of him. We've forgotten the God that formed me. Verse 19 says, And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them, because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. And so, so long ago in Deuteronomy 32, that same disappointment, and you can go back to Matthew chapter 17, that same just sheer abhorring, really. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, an emotion so strong as hatred in God's heart when he sees his people that he has begotten, his people that he has formed, unmindful of him, forgetting of him. Not believing in him, having no faith. And so in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus looks out at them and says, Faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? He says, Perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? And how long shall I suffer and put up with you? Faithless is being doubtful and an unbelief. Perverse is being turned aside from the right path, being corrupted. Something that's perverted is something that's not right. 
It's not natural. It's natural for us as sons of God to act like sons of God. And when we don't, we're perverse. And the only reason why we don't act like the sons of God is because we don't have the faith to do it. We don't believe on God and His promises enough to just take hold of them and receive them and walk in them. And so Christ here, in an indictment to His disciples who could not cast out but one devil... One devil, after all the teaching that they had heard, after all the preaching that they have heard, after all the lessons, haven't I outlined about 13 lessons? I believe Christ has walked them through bit by bit by bit. And then he even shows them his glory. What reason would they have to now be doubtful and perverted? Faithless and turning aside from that right path. What do they have? And now you can see why God would be so frustrated. Why Jesus would look at them and say, How long shall I suffer you? How long shall I put up with this? After all that's been taught, and all of my, my desiring that you would follow me so I could make you a fisher of men now, but one devil has stifled you. What he needs from his believers is the same as what he needs from you as a believer. You need active faith. You need to act upon the faith that you have. You're believing. You're saved. You're going to heaven. Glory to God. Now do something with it. The same thing James thought in James chapter 2. Brethren, get to work. Brethren, show out the faith that God has worked in. Perform faith. Faithing would be the active word there. Essentially, these believers have plateaued, haven't they? This happens to us. We we get saved. We start to do Christian things. We start to resemble Christian people. And then it gets to the point where we just kind of plateau, right? You can be a really good Christian and on the plateau and on the plane. Think about the different groups that we saw in the previous week. We saw the multitudes. And there was probably believers in there mixed in among the world. And then we saw the disciples, the nine that were gathered together a little bit closer to Christ but not close enough that they could understand something like the transfiguration. How do I know that? Because he invited three to behold that transfiguration, and the ones that were, let's say, worthy to come that close, or at least understanding enough, or at least faithful enough to come that close to God, they were dumbfounded in so much that Peter, one of the pillars, said, let's make tabernacles, Jesus, not knowing what he said, having no clue what just came out of his mouth. When all of that was said and done, Jesus said unto them, Until the resurrection, please don't share that. Tell no man what you saw. Why? Because they're not ready. They're not prepared for that. They've plateaued. They've gotten to the point where they can't really go any farther in their Christian life. But God is calling us unto higher ground, to come up unto him, just like we read about in Joshua. He's inviting us up into his glory. He's inviting us up into his presence. Don't get stuck in the plateau, Christian. Don't be faithless and perverse. Don't cause this level of disappointment that Christ has shown to his disciples. Don't cause that to be seen in your life from his perspective. You will plateau in your Christian life if you refuse to present yourself as that living sacrifice. If you refuse to present yourself as that vessel in the Master's hand to be used for His purposes and for His glory. And as He takes that vessel, do you know what He wants to do? He wants to make you into His image. Exactly how He is. From glory to glory. You will plateau in your Christian life if you refuse to believe on Jesus. And we know about this in John chapter, 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe from the name of the Son of God, that you may first know that you have eternal life, and second, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. In other words, believe, receive, and obtain that like precious faith so that you can know you're saved, first and foremost, And secondly, so that you can continue to believe on Christ. Trust Him. Act out the faith that you have. And grow 
in faith along the way. You can see the Lord's disappointment. Oh, faithless and perverse generation. It's like he's talking to unbelievers here. He's not, though. He's talking to his own disciples. After all they've learned, after all they've saw, after all the time that he has spent with them, one devil could not be cast out because of their unbelief. And that's what's hindering us. Look at Matthew chapter 17 and verse 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart. Of course, this is something that they wouldn't want to act in, ask in public. They came to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? Why could we not get rid of this one devil and the child? Verse 20, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. There it is. That's what was hindering them. And there it is. That's what's hindering us. If we're not overcoming in the Christian life, if we're not gaining ground, if we are constantly um, being, being pressed down and pushed down without measure, if we're constantly suffering setbacks and hardships, we're not growing, it's because of our unbelief. If we can't cast but one devil out of our lives, it's because we do not believe in God, Almighty God. Continue verse 20. It says, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place. And it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. A mustard grain. Grain of mustard seed, it says. In other places, talks about it being the littlest of seeds, but grows into a big tree that the birds can dwell in. What he's saying is if you had just a little bit of faith in an unbelievably capable and powerful God, mountains can be removed. Nothing shall be impossible to you. Let's see some examples. Go with me keeping your finger there, to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. When you want to see examples of faith, go to the hall of faith, as it's sometimes called. In Hebrews chapter 11, we find example upon example upon example upon example of men that had faith and did through their faith. So their faith wasn't just to get them saved. Their faith went into action. They were faithing, as it were. They were acting out their faith. Let's go to a few examples. Number four, by faith, Abel offered. See that? By faith, he offered. That was his action. Verse five, by faith, Enoch, it says, pleased God. There at the end of the verse. That was his action. And the Bible actually says, without faith it is impossible to please him. In that very next word, verse, verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let's look for some other things that men through faith did. By faith Noah, look at that, prepared an ark. He got to work, didn't he? He did something with his faith. It started that he was believing on God, but then he put that to action. Verse 8, by faith Abraham, a little bit down it says, obeyed and he went out. So there's the action that he did as a result of his faith. He believed God, it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and then he obeyed when God said to go into a land that he had never been to. And there sojourned. As it says in verse 9, by faith he sojourned in a land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of, with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Verse 11, through faith also Sarah, it says, she judged. In other words, she made decisions because she had faith in God, Almighty God. Verse 13, these all died in faith, 
not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off and were, watch this, persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. So promises that are made by God, we don't always receive, but if we believe unto them to the end that we're persuaded that they're ours, and we embrace them as if they are ours and hold them tight and close, and we confess that, hey, this isn't my land, I'm just a passing through, God will ultimately make all of these promises come true. When I'm with him, you too will die in faith. Dying in faith. Not having received promises, perhaps, but persuaded of them, embracing them to receive them at such a day which is to come. Look with me down in verse 17. More examples. By faith, Abraham, look at that, offered up Isaac. I'm just taken by faith and what their action was, right? There's other words there that explain, explain more of the context and what was taking place. But ultimately, Abraham, by faith, offered up Isaac. That's what he did. Continues on, and it says in verse 20, By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. He believed God enough that he reached out and blessed Jacob. And you can read the account. He told of the promise that would come. He transferred the promises of God unto him. Why? Because he believed them so much. Though he hadn't received them, he embraced them. He accounted them for his, gave them unto his son. He was fully persuaded of the word of God. Verse 22, by faith Joseph, when he died, it says gave commandment. So he gave commandment concerning his bone. Why? Because he believed God. God, by faith, he gave commandment. Verse 23, by faith, Moses was hid. His mother scooped him up and put him in, in an ark in the river, just trusting that God would care for that son, going on the promise that God had made to her. Verse 24, by faith, Moses refused. His action was to say, no, I will not be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He believed that the reward was coming his way. And so by faith, Moses said, nope, I don't want what the world has to offer. He refused. Verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt. Verse 28, by faith he kept the Passover. Verse 29, by faith he passed through the Red Sea. By faith, verse 30, they compassed about the walls of Jericho seven days and that thing fell. By faith, verse 31, the harlot Rahab received the spies with peace. Verse 32, what more shall I say? Good question. What more should we say about the example of those that went before us who through faith did blank? Insert what God has called you to do. Through faith, Brother Jamie, blank. Through faith, Brother Yuri, blank. And so on, and so on, and so on. Through faith, each and every one of us can do great things for God. Be a numbered among the unnamed here at the end of this chapter. We can read through that in our own time. I get fired up reading that. I want to run out of time, though. What more shall we say? Really? The examples that went before us, go to Matthew chapter 17. The examples that went before us are simply this. Through faith, do. Through faith, action. Through faith, work. Through faith, long suffer. Through faith, toil. Through faith, serve. Through faith, do what God commanded you to do. Be active in your faith, lest you be called faithless and perverse when God looks upon you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, is what I want to hear when I stand before him. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 17. Oh, faithless, perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? 
Verse 20, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Your struggles and your trials in your life, do you think they are more difficult than moving an entire mountain? Just physically speaking. What would it take to move a mountain? According to Christ, just a mustard seed of faith. What will it take to remove? Remember how we asked everybody to think on something they want answered and prayed for to God today? I think it's a lot easier for God to solve that than it is for a whole mountain to get up and move to another place. Just give him that mustard seed of faith. And when he comes to you and says, I will answer this prayer, but I need you to do, just do it. Because that's what every one of these things was in Hebrews 11. Deliverance for the people of Israel. It's yours if you put blood on the doorpost. Promise to go into the promised land. It's yours if you bring the bones, Jacob, with you. It, it, all of these things were always conditional as he worked with us in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. If ye will, I will. And God's working the same way in our lives. Just have the faith to believe God and whatever he says, do it and it shall be yours. Don't be faithless. Be active in your belief. We need to be first, faithing, putting actions to our belief. Secondly, look at verse 20, 21. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Fasting then, not so much the keeping yourself from food or for water or whatever. Fasting in a nutshell can be this. Seeking God sacrificially. Giving up something. Sacrificing something so that you can get a hold of God. God wants us faithing. Go to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. God wants us being active in our faith. Doing showing our faith by our actions and our activities. He also wants us not only faithing, but fasting, actively seeking God sacrificially and waiting on Him to do the work. Isaiah chapter 58 is a, is a chapter that talks more specifically about fasting and, and the purposes for it. Isaiah chapter 58. Look at verse 3. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. And I think their problem was they were a generation without faith. You have to believe God. Fast, and the solution comes. Especially this kind, which is what Christ was talking about with respect to the devil that could not be cast out. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. They're talking to God. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Here's the response. God says, Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. In other words, your fast is something that you enjoy and rejoice over. You're exacting all of your labors. You've got your whole day lined up with how you're going to perform this fast. He says, Behold, motives are being called into question here with respect to their fasting. He says, Behold, ye fast for strife and debate. And to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice heard on high. So in other words, if your voice is going to be heard on high, it's not because you fasted the way you're fasting this day. For strife, for debate, to smite with the fist, finding pleasure, exacting all your labors. God's going to show you what the fast is ought to be like. In verse 5, Is it such a fast as I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul. In other words, everything that is soulish, carnal about you, afflict it. Let it suffer. Let it go without. You're trying to be more spiritual. You're trying to put off this tabernacle and be closer to God. In order that he would hear your faith thing, your action of your faith, and would get on board and do what you've requested. It says, is it to bow down his head as a bulrush? In other words, just, just putting your head down low. And it says, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him. 
Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day unto the Lord? Everything you've seen here is outward. A man is showing his desperation. He's showing his head in the bulrushes. He's laying in a swamp, as it were, sackcloth and ashes and just this deplorable sight. Is this what God considers an acceptable fast? Verse 6, I don't think so. It says, is not this the fast that I have chosen? Now here's the purpose. Here's the motive in which somebody would fast. To loose the bands of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens. I think the devil would, the devil, uh, would fall into that category from Matthew 17. And to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. So the fast and the motive for fast is actually to release and loose, release someone from the bands of wickedness. Have heavy burdens fall off them. Have the oppressed go free. And every yoke that is upon them be relinquished and destroyed. Verse 7, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? In other words, sacrificing for yourself to give to the hungry? That thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, inviting those that have nothing in so you can show hospitality to them? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? The fast that God has chosen here then is a selfish fast. It's a fast in order to get what somebody else needs and wants and, and, and would help them, not for yourself. And in the first examples, you see my face in the, in the, in the muck and, and me mourning and suffering and, and showing. It's like the Pharisees that whenever they fasted, they would just show how they were so hungry and diminished and just defeated and then say, oh, I'm fasting today. And, and they would be hypocritical in that sense. Going back to Matthew 17. But God wants you showing your faith, putting actions to your belief, and He wants you fasting. In other words, seeking Him sacrificially in order to benefit others, not just yourself. Not, I'm going to fast so that I can get that car that I really want. So I'm going to fast so that I can have that healing come into my life, though for the right motives, that would be the right thing to do. Primarily, the fast that God desires is that you would set others free as a result of your sacrifice. That is action. That is, if you go to 1 Corinthians 13, charity, selfless, envieth not, vaunteth not itself up, is not puffed up, is not, soon, is not full of self, is not full of pride. True love and charity is the expression of the faith that God wants us to have here and what he's talking about. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 22 the Bible says, And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. They shall kill him, and the third day shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. This kills me because this also happened in 16 and verse 21, chapter 16 and verse 21, where it says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. Watch this. And be raised again the third day. Back in Matthew chapter 17. They missed that same statement in verse 23. They shall kill him. Okay, that's something to be exceeding sorry for. But look what they ignored. And the third day he shall be raised again. Why were they sorrowful? Why was Peter rebuking Jesus? Why? Because he was focused on the loss that was going to happen and not believing on, by faith, the promise of his resurrection. Just so focused on here and now, not believing of the promise that shall come. And that wasn't the group in Hebrews chapter 11, wasn't it? The Hebrews chapter 11 group didn't receive of the promise, so they saw Christ killed, let's say. But the group in Hebrews chapter 11 also hoped for the resurrection that was to come. They hoped for the promise that was made. They hoped for those little two words raised again, connected to the he shall be. That's what they missed out on. And so they got sorrowful. They got mourning. Peter rebuked Jesus and said, not so, Lord, because they did not believe him. They were blinded to the truth. When in fact what they should have been is like the Hebrews 11 group, persuaded of the promise, embracing the promise. That's the truth. You know God's promise is just as true 
as anything else that can be stated. It's truth, present, past, future. That's true. That's the word of God. That's his promise. So be persuaded of that. Embrace that. And so walk in the light that Christ offers us. We can be free to actively show our faith as Christ desires only if we're persuaded of and embrace the promises that he made. In other words, grain of mustard seed of my faith, mountain gone. Why? Because God said it was so. Little bit of faith. I'm persuaded. I'm embracing that God. I believe in that. And he makes it so. And that's how we walk in the faith as God requires of us, as he wants of us. Our example, again, just in the context of Matthew chapter 17. In verse 24 it says, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? So they come to him and they say, Is, is he going to give his shekel? Is he going to give that silver dollar? Is he going to pay tribute to Caesar? What sayest thou, Peter? Is your Lord going to give Caesar the money that is his? Peter's response in verse 25, he saith, yes. When he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, there you go, Simon Peter putting his foot in his mouth again. He says, yes, absolutely, he pays tribute. Jesus prevented him, saying, what thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? This is taxes. Of their own children or of strangers? Verse 26, Peter saith unto him of strangers, Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free. The lesson here is, again, to render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, to render unto God things which are God's. Ultimately, we are, as it says in verse 26, of the category of strangers. Strangers, foreigners, Hebrews 11 talks about that. The, the saints of old, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, enjoyed being strangers and foreigners in a strange land. That's what we are as, as an example. This isn't our home. Canada isn't our home. We're just a passing through. We're strangers. We might as well dwell in tents for the present reality that we are in. We are strangers, pilgrims, sojourners. And to accept, then, the status to be tax-free is to become... Caesar's property, okay? When you become tax-free, you become just like Caesar's property. I'm going to build more upon that next week, but for now, we'll just leave the lesson there that taxes are for strangers. Therefore, Christians ought to just pay the taxes. Peter said right, but then Jesus taught him a little bit of a lesson out of there. Does Jesus pay tribute? Yes. But Simon, what thinkest thou? Where do they exact their taxes from? Their own children or strangers? Of course, strangers. Well, that's us. So yeah, we do pay the taxes. Why? Because it belongs to Caesar. Render it to Caesar. If it belongs to God, render it to God. And this is why what happens in God's house is completely up to God and his people to decide. Not Caesar. Verse 27. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, Go thou to the sea and cast an hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give to them for me and for thee. So what he is saying is, well, it is our responsibility as strangers to render unto Caesar tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, Ultimately, any of that rendering is going to go at the provision and promise of God Almighty God. Because he says, go and fish, and I'll give you what you need for the taxes. Some people want to fight against the taxes. They want to say, we should live tax-free. If we're strangers and foreigners, according to the Bible here, we ought to render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. But we have that wonderful promise of God that going up and catching one fish will be enough and suffice to give Caesar all his due. Second Timothy 2 says this, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Okay, We're strangers, we're foreigners, we look for a better country, we have a promise to come, obviously in glory one day. And so as we're warring here in the spirit, 
don't entangle yourself with the affairs of this life. In other words, don't end up like a Ken Hovind who fought the tax man and ended up in shackles. It doesn't make sense to do that. Go a fishing, pull up a coin, and give it to him. Who cares, right? He says, no man that warreth in the spiritual battle entangleth himself with the affairs of his life. In other words, get entangled up with what's going on in this life. Why? That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Bringing it around. How do you please God? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. What is he showing? That by faith, you can even pay Caesar's dumb taxes. By simply going and obeying what God says. Look, Jesus said, go and fish and you'll get a coin. Peter had to make the decision whether he was going to believe the word of God by faith and act upon it. When he believed and act upon it, provision was made. The prayer was answered. They could pay the tax, and they didn't offend Caesar, and they carried on in their ministry. Done, done, done. Piece of cake. Peter's chosen. We're chosen. We're called to live a life of glory and virtue. We're to Press on from where we are at. Don't plateau. Live higher than where you're at right now. Every day increasing. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue, temperance, to temperance, knowledge, and so on and so forth. Why? That we can please Him. And the Bible says very clearly that without faith it is impossible to please Him. And that, I believe, is what God here is trying to show His people. Guys, have faith. If you had faith just as a grain of mustard, if you sacrificed just a little and showed some charity, that devil would take a hike and there would be nothing to restrain him. But because of your unbelief, you lost the battle. Believe God. Don't be faithless. Don't be perverse. But trust him and walk in that faith. Action is what he's saying. If I say go fishing, go fishing if that means that the promise that I made to you will be fulfilled. And we have the same thing. Through faith, do. Through faith, get to work. Through faith, grow. Through faith, increase. Is what God wants from us. And that's what he's teaching his disciples. After he showed his glory, looks like they took a step back. But they didn't. He just used this as another opportunity to teach them more things. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He says, follow me, shows his glory, and then he brings them right back to showing how to be a fisher of fish as an example of being a fisher of men. Let's continue to follow him in this study.